study. This series that we're looking at now is Standing on the Promises of God. And we've looked at a number of the promises of God and we, 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 we're trying to get all of us to see that we can stand through all these difficult times because we're standing on the promises of God. Today's lesson, we'll look at two more promises of God. I will forgive you and I will save you. Second Peter chapter three, verse number nine reads, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some may account slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is why we're standing on the promises of God because God keeps his promises. Another in the list of promises found given to God's children is the promise to forgive our sins. This promise is personal and universal. It's personal because each one of us has sin in our lives that requires forgiveness. It's universal because it's open to all who will obey. It's not just for Israel. It's not just for the patriarchs, the prophets, or the apostles, but to all who will obey. First John chapter 1, verse number 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So since we all have sinned, we all need forgiveness. And it's great to be able to rely on the promise of God that he will forgive us. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Verse number 14, after the dedication of the temple that Solomon built, and he asked God, if, I, if your people turn to you and pray to you, please hear from heaven. And God's answer, he says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So as I said earlier, those who obey, God will forgive. We all need forgiveness. Romans chapter three, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. One thing about this promise is that we need forgiveness. We need forgiveness. It's personal. We cannot accept the thought that we're good people who occasionally do bad things because the reality is we're bad people who occasionally do good things. Look at what else Paul says to the Romans. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. To the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter two, he writes, and you hath he quickened 
who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Because of these passages, the Bible lets us know that we need forgiveness, and we should never forget it. We cannot abuse our forgiveness. Just because God forgave your sins and the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us from our sins, we do not get a free pass to continue to sin. Again to the Romans in chapter 6 verses 1 and 2, Paul asks a question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? With salvation comes sanctification, the setting apart from the world. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Remember, God said, I will transform you. When you do not work at change, you abuse the forgiveness given. In other words, if you continually, continually do the things that displease God, thinking that God's going to forgive me, then you abuse God's privilege. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God expects us to become new. He expects us to change, and he sent his Holy Spirit to help us. How can anyone who understands forgiveness continue to willfully sin? That shows you don't understand God, and you don't understand the conditions of his promise. He promised to forgive us, but he also promised to transform us. How can anyone who knows the price of forgiveness not try to change? Look at the magnitude of what the deed of forgiveness is. Look at what Jesus' blood covers. I lied. I forgive you. I cheated. I forgive you. I stole. I forgive you. I murdered. I forgive you. I was promiscuous. I forgive you. I was unfaithful. I forgive you. I was mean. I forgive you. I molested. I forgive you. I was a prostitute. I forgive you. I beat my wife. I forgive you. Whatever you've done, he forgives you. If you believe the other promises, you must also believe this promise. Romans 4 and 7, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Think about it. As badly as we behaved in the past, God still forgave us. It's wonderful to know that we have been forgiven and will be forgiven. We can get constant assurance from scripture that never changes, that God will forgive us. But what about us? How should we be? We know God will forgive us. What about us? Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter six in the model prayer. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And again in chapter 18 of the book of Matthew, starting at verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask and it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Then came Peter unto him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. Look how important forgiveness from us to one another is to Jesus. Here's an example. Verse 24, and when he began to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me. I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And when he would not, and he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. If you want to enjoy the forgiveness of God the forgiveness that God provides. Practice forgiving your brother because God will forgive you. The next and final promise we're going to look at in this series, I will save you. John chapter 20, uh, starting at verse 24, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands 
and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. That was his purpose to save us. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 21. At the announcement of his birth, the angel of the Lord told Mary that she shall bring forth the son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. The parents of Jesus were told he came to save his people from their sins. John states that the things that were written were chosen from among the very many things that Jesus did so that we might believe. Look at what else he said, chapter 21. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Just the thought of that. I mean, we've already read of some remarkable things that Jesus did. And John said, there's many more that weren't even written. I can only imagine the things that Jesus did, the joy that he brought to the people with the miracles and wonders that he performed and the lessons that he taught. But the main thing we're looking at now is the fact that he came to save us. These that were written were for us to believe in him and obtain life through his name. If you can't believe all that's already written, it would do you no good to have eight more books written. John said, these that were written were written for you to believe that Jesus is the Christ. John 3, 16 tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Acts 16, verses 29 through 33. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 through 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand. Verse two, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Sometimes Satan will have you doubt your salvation. He'll make you think you have to have a certain number of good works. He'll, he'll make you compare yourself to others. He'll, he'll make you think you're saved because you're good. But don't believe his lies. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When you recognize how far out you really were and how much God really 
hates sin. This really becomes the greatest promise of them all. Isaiah puts it this way in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Behold, Jehovah's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So it was our sinfulness that kept us a guilty distance from God. I will save you. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. It's not healthy or scriptural or beneficial at all to doubt your salvation. If Jesus said he would save you, and you obeyed him, then he has. In this series, we looked at several promises from God, and this certainly is not all of them. I will transform you. I will give you what you need. I will answer you. I will take care of you. I will be with you. I will forgive you. I will save you. Because of who God is and who Jesus is, we can stand on his promises. I hope this has helped to strengthen your faith, especially during these trying times, that God keeps his promises. And no matter how long this pandemic lasts, God said, I'll take care of you. I'll give you what you need, and I will save you. Join us next week as we go into another study of God's word and see what he has left for us to know. Until then, as always, I ask you, we pray that you will be careful and that you'll be prayerful. God bless you. Show, show me, show me the way. Show me, show me, show me